Good afternoon. Que uh, bonjour. Uh, bienvenue au Centre des Arts de la Confédération. My name is Steve Bellamy. I'm CEO here at Confederation Center. And it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you both here and online to this very special day, this very special launch. Um, for all of you, I'd like to begin by recognizing that the center operates on Epiquet in Mi'kmaq, in Mi'kma'ki, the home of the Mi'kmaq for thousands of years. The center operates in collaboration and friendship and works with the Mi'kmaq artists and storytellers, as well as First Nations Inuit and Métis storytellers and artists from across Canada. Um, we work towards intercultural understanding and, and reconciliation through, through uh, learning about each other's cultures. It's a pleasure to acknowledge some very special guests that are here with us today. Her Honor, Lieutenant Governor Antoinette Perry, thank you for coming. Charlottetown MP Sean Casey is here. Uh, UPI President Greg Keefe, thank you for coming. My apologies if I've missed any other dignitaries. I, I can no longer see <laughs> any of you. Um, <clears throat> I want to give thanks to our funding partners, the Government of Canada, uh, Province of Prince Edward Island, the City of Charlottetown, and uh, in particular today, the uh, Canadian Museum of History's Digital Museums Canada program. Um, there are a large number of speakers today, so I will only take one minute, but I do want to mention the importance of Lucy Maud Montgomery and Anne of Green Gables to the center, uh, to the island. It, it cannot be overstated. Uh, Anne a toujours fait partie de la programmation du centre depuis nos débuts, et elle continue de l'être. Prendre ces manuscrits accessibles à plus de gens est un grand accomplissement. The story of Anne has paved the way here at the center uh, for the center to be a national leader in the creation of new work, new musicals. And now this story is leading the way again as the center looks to grow our digital programming in all of our departments to reach out to more people who aren't necessarily here physically and to connect with more people wherever they are. So Anne is once again leading the charge with this project. We're so excited about it. Anytime we can increase accessibility to materials that are in our care, in our collection, uh, is a very good day. So I want to express deep gratitude and thanks to all the people involved in this project, to Kevin and the team at the center, uh, to the partner organizations who are going to be named. I won't do it again because we'll be repeating things. Uh, and, and everyone that's been involved in this multi-year and really significant project to increase accessibility. So thank you very much. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, the MP for Charlottetown, Sean Casey, to say a few words. Sean. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, your Honor, L Lieutenant Governor Antoinette Perry, uh, quelqu'un que j'ai vu à quelques reprises uh, cette semaine, je pense que nous sommes sur le même uh, circuit. Uh, Peut-être je veux poser la question, uh, où allons-nous demain? <laughs> <laughs> um, President Keefe, uh, look, I, any chance I get to come to another good news announcement at the Confederation Center of the Arts is a good day. Uh, the Confederation Center of the Arts really defines uh, Charlottetown, defines Prince Edward Island, and is such a significant player in the national conversation of who we are, the telling of Canadian stories. And this is yet another example. So um, every time, every time, most of the time when I come, I'm, I'm, I'm coming with, a, with an injection of cash. Today I'm not. Um, <laughs> but that's not to say that I won't be back before too long. There are a few things in the hopper. Um, so let me just uh, convey on behalf of the Government of Canada and, and myself uh, my congratulations for the work that's gone into this launch of the digital uh, manuscript today. Um, I, I understand the, uh, the, the partners uh, who've had a major role to play in this, uh, one of which was already named uh, Digital Museums Canada, which has provided almost a quarter of a million dollars in funding the L.M. Montgomery Institute and the Robertson Library at UPEI. When I first um, decided to put my name on the ballot in 2011, um, I, had, I, I wasn't on social media. Uh, the, it, when I was practicing law, that really wasn't important. The most important thing when you're practicing law is people's privacy, not 
blasting out what you do. And uh, I was pulled aside and I was told, uh, you, need to, you need to sign up for this and this and this and Facebook and whatever else was on the go. Because if you're not in people's phones, you don't exist. And uh, that was 12 years ago. Um, so to see Anne, uh, to see the, uh, the, the manuscript being made accessible in this form is a, a true indication of where we are and what our role is, as, as, as Steve indicated. So um, good on everyone who had a role in making this happen. Uh, my, uh, my warm congratulations and uh, best wishes for success in all that you do. I know that there's a, there's a lot of things ongoing. It's, decided, it's an exciting time at the center and uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to play whatever supportive role I can. You have a, you have a champion in the center right here. Thank you. It really is blinding up there. <laughs> so I've played a role in the preservation of this artifact, the Anne of Green Gables manuscript for many years. And it's always a question of balancing use, access, and preservation. It's an ongoing process. But we really are excited to think about this digitization project as a preservation measure as well as an accessibility measure. You know, right now we carefully store it in a nice archival box. We store it in a room that is secure with climate control, humidity control, um, all of those sorts of things that you would expect in a museum collection. But we also see that people love this manuscript and when we exhibit it from time to time, it's quite a moving thing for people who have traveled around the world to visit the land written about by Ellen Montgomery. So we want to balance use, preservation, and that is really achieved, I think, through this project, and that's really exciting for us. I want to really quickly thank the project team. Some of them will be speaking, uh, but some of them won't be, and I think they're here, so I just want to quickly mention them. So, very quickly, Emily Horn is a project manager. She has managed very efficiently the five phases of this project and lots of conversations, helpful conversations with Digital Museums Canada. Uh, Craig McLeod at Graphcom. Craig, just wave if, if you're here. I can't, oh, there you are. Thank you so much for building a wonderful website. It's not a small website. It's a very large website. It's bilingual and it has a lot of accessibility um, measures that are being met. Um, Monique LaFontaine will be talking later. She's translated this work. Um, Betsy Epperly will be speaking later via video. And Dr. Emily Wooster, the curator of this exhibition, will be introducing the site to you. Um, our partners at UPI's uh, Robertson Library and the Ellen Montgomery Institute will be speaking. Thank you, Philip and Donald, for being here. Donald, I would love for you to come forward and make some brief remarks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Donald Moses and I'm the University Librarian at the Robertson Library at UPEI. Uh, we were pleased to be a partner on the project and to have the opportunity uh, to work with this really unique uh, uh, item, Montgomery's original manuscript. Uh, at the Robertson Library, we have a state-of-the-art digitization lab and we consider ourselves leaders in this field uh, so it would be a, a perfect uh, match for uh, this project. Uh, we use our expertise uh, and our equipment to transform a variety of physical formats into digital works that we describe, make accessible, preserve, and steward. Uh, we have a fantastic team at the Robertson Library, uh, and I'd especially like to acknowledge uh, the folks that uh, were responsible for digitizing the manuscript there. Uh, that includes our community history librarian, Kelty McPhail, library technician Robin Thompson uh, for their work uh, digitizing the manuscript and creating those high resolution images that are used in the project. The manuscript itself, uh, as, as Kevin highlighted, 
uh, presented several challenges, including its fragility. Um, the order of the pages uh, was very, very important, and there are a lot of pages. Uh, the pages themselves are, are being um, quite fragile, and so uh, in some cases, uh, a variety of different techniques were used to achieve the best scan possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, University Archivist and Special Collections Librarian Simon Lloyd uh, for his ongoing uh, advice and in-depth knowledge of Montgomery and Montgomery's works uh, during this project. Simon curates and, and stewards the uh, collection of all the Montgomery materials uh, at the Robertson Library. Uh, and it's uh, terrific to see uh, our contribution reflected in the manuscript uh, uh, launch today. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to collaborate uh, with the Confederation Center Art Gallery and Museum and the L.M. Montgomery Institute uh, on this project, and, and thank you for that. I'd now like to introduce uh, Monique Lafontaine, the project translator. It is really blinding. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. In my 30 plus year career as a translator, I don't think I've ever run into such a project, both in terms of length and complexity. And in terms of length, I mean it really kept growing. There were parts of it that were more traditional, like the work I normally work with in the art gallery and elsewhere, but there were other parts that were completely different. The parts that were similar were the sections that dealt with uh, the island in Lucy Montgomery's days. But what the challenge was, was dealing with transforming the published, <clears throat> sorry, the French published translation of the novel into something that would be a pretend draft. I encountered several problems during this, and there were several reasons for this. First, a good translator will never translate word for word, because that would be uh, making the work not true to the essence of the, the target language. And also, secondly, French tends to prefer the active voice as opposed to the passive voice. Therefore, a large number of the pages of the manuscript and the verso pages had to be rewritten to make sure that they match what's on the English manuscript that people can read, because both are side by side. You can see the manuscript on one side, and in the case of the French side, of the French site, you can see the French transcription. A few of the things that were uh, different to deal with was the fact that in English, uh, repetitions are not a problem. So in the same paragraph or same page, you can have said Matthew, said Marilla, said Anne. But in French, there is a rule that says repetitions are a no, no. We don't like repetitions. But the problem that happened with this is that in the published version of the book, what happened is that the translator, doing you know what's supposed to be done, changed some of the words said to, for example, um, whispered, admonished, exclaimed. But by doing so, sometimes he was not true to the essence of what Montgomery was trying to say. So I did what I'm not supposed to do, and I went back to said, 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 said. <laughs> Plant names were another challenge. Everybody knows that Montgomery and Anne love plants and gardening. And sometimes the names that Montgomery was using for plants names were not, are not names that are used anymore. And so it involved a fair bit of research to see, okay, what's that plant and what is it nowadays known as? Uh, Emily Wooster, thank you, Emily, and Betsy Epperly did an amazing job of research and writing the annotation. And this, these ended up, in some cases, just as challenging as the adaptation of the manuscript. Through their research, it was revealed that, for instance, uh, what looked like a, a sentence that Montgomery wrote was, in fact, well, it came from one of the Shakespeare's plays. And so I had to say, oh my God, all of these translations, these plays have been translated. In some cases, they were translated by Victor Hugo, the author of Les Mis, so I had to stick to his words. <laughs> yeah. So I had to do some research and then replace what the translator had put in because he did not know it came from Shakespeare. Now we know. And also a lot of the excerpts came from the Bible, same thing, research the Bible. However, there were a lot of poems, journals, newspaper articles that were quoted, and uh, these were never translated. And normally, if we translate something, we would say traduction libre, which means it's not an official translation. But after one of our meetings, we agreed that this would have happened so often that, yeah, we're not going to do that. So on one more thing, Montgomery was immensely interested in fashion, and so was Anne. 
So do the words puff sleeve mean anything to you? <laughs> well, there were countless details about dresses that involved a fair bit of research as ruffles, pleats, ruches, not my strong suit, and they're rarely encountered in today's world of fashion. All in all, despite all the challenges, it was a most enjoyable project. I learned a lot, not only about Anne in Montgomery, but about also the life and time at Anne, during Montgomery's life. I would like to leave you with one bit of trivia I learned from Emily. It's one of the annotations in the chapter titled, Matthew Insists on Puff Sleeves. So for you who have seen the musical or have read the book, you know that Matthew is a bit on the shy side, and when he goes to buy a puff sleeve dress for Anne, he goes to the store and he doesn't know how to say it, so he ends up buying a lot of brown sugar. So the annotation that Emily wrote was very enlightening. So, and I quote, Contemporary brown sugar is most often made of refined white sugar and molasses added back in. Historically, however, brown sugar was the sugar derived, derived right from sugarcane, less processed than its white sugar derivative. In the early 19th century, however, a powerful sugar industry convinced some cooks that the more refined, i.e. more expensive, white sugar was the superior project, product. Sorry even going as far as to release pamphlets with photos of microscopic, harmless, or fictional microbes and mites found in brown sugar. Nick, your honor. Good afternoon, everyone. The Ellen Montgomery Institute at UPEI was founded in 1993 by Dr. Elizabeth Epperly and colleagues with a joint mission to promote research into and inform celebration of Montgomery's life, times, her works, and her cultural significance. Today's digital exhibition launch is a perfect example of those purposes converging. We have an opportunity to showcase existing and enable new scholarship around this first novel and Montgomery's writing process, and we have an opportunity to celebrate for students and scholars, enthusiasts and fans, and those just about to discover the pleasures of time spent with Montgomery. The Institute's work is carried out in partnership, sometimes big partners like the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, supporting the Institute's biennial international conferences. Last June's conference had registrants from 17 countries. The Council supporting the Institute's Journal of Ellen Montgomery Studies, edited by UPEI's Dr. Kate Scarth, and available as an open access online publication of peer-reviewed articles, also creative writing and poetry, created in partnership with the extraordinary staff at Robertson Library. Partnerships over the years with the Confederation Center of the Arts, and most especially Kevin and the Art Gallery, with the dedicated and creative staff of Parks Canada, with the unfailingly supportive heirs of Ellen Montgomery, individual donors such as Dr. Donna Campbell are also key. So too are the individuals steeped in Montgomery knowledge across Prince Edward Island, at Montgomery's Ontario homes, and in communities from Minnesota to Scotland to Ukraine to Japan, all over the world. The Institute is proud to be a partner in today's launch, especially proud of the project's curator, Dr. Emily Wooster, a former visiting scholar to the Institute, and proud of the vision and expertise of the exhibit's contributing consultant, Dr. Elizabeth Epperly, former president of the University of Prince Edward Island, Montgomery scholar and founder of the Ellen Montgomery Institute. Dr. Epperly is unable to be here today, but she recorded a few remarks that we will play for you now. Greetings to distinguished guests, Ellen Montgomery enthusiasts, sponsors, and partners. When I first sat down with one of Montgomery's novel manuscripts in the Confederation Center Art Gallery in April of 1979, I folded my white gloved hands in reverence to sit in front of the pages Montgomery herself touched. There may be nothing to equal this experience of being in the real time presence of actual pages written by a beloved author. Father Bolger and I had just spent two years reading Montgomery's hundreds of pages of letters to her Scottish pen pal, George Boyd McMillan. We had worked with photocopies, not originals. Engrossed by what Montgomery was saying, I almost forgot the pages themselves. With the novel manuscripts, I was aware of the significance of what photocopies cannot capture, changes in the paper and quality, even color of ink. 
It matters what and how something was added. The full manuscript of Montgomery's first novel, Anne of Green Gables, is a revelation. In 1979, I could not imagine the technology that could approximate the in-person experience of turning Montgomery's pages. Even in 2002, when we, here at the Confederation Center, launched a virtual Museum Canada exhibition featuring digitized pages of Montgomery's personal scrapbooks, the technology of the day only enabled us to share a very limited selection of images. But now, working with the accommodating and inventive Graphcom team, we may have created the closest thing to being with the manuscript in person. Through our Digital Museum Canada exhibition, viewers may experience what each page, front and back, expresses. In addition, there are magical links, colorful contextual pieces, photographs, video clips, questions, even an animation of the McNeil Kitchen moment in 1905 where it all began. It has been a highlight of my more than 65 years as a Montgomery enthusiast to work with Emily Wooster, the curator, and with the stellar team, including the Ellen Montgomery Institute and the Robertson Library of UPEI that Kevin Rice assembled and encouraged. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm Emily Worcester, friend and researcher for the Ellen Montgomery Institute, assistant professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth, Montgomery enthusiast and grateful curator of this exhibit. It is a dream to be here today after two and a half years of work, work made lighter by an incredible team of people whose enthusiasm and creativity have infused this whole project with joy. But now I think we buried the lead enough. <laughs> Let's look at the site. I'd like to start at the very beginning, at the moment that started it all. Montgomery writes, I remember well the very evening I wrote the opening paragraph of Green Gables. It was a moist, showery, sweet-scented evening in June 10 years ago. I was sitting on the end of the table, her emphasis, in the old kitchen, my feet on the sofa beside the west window because I wanted to get the last gleams of daylight on my portfolio. I did not for a moment dream that the book I had just begun was to bring me the fame and success I had long dreamed of. So I wrote the opening paragraphs quite easily, not feeling obliged to write up to any particular reputation or style. So let's imagine that moment together with the help of our illustrator and animator, Lillian G. Does that build enough anticipation yet? That quiet moment, so beautifully captured here, and that first sheet of paper on which Montgomery crossed out a previously written bit of short story to begin Anne, has shaped Canadian literary history and this island. When I was asked to join the Manuscript Project team in 2019, I was asked what my vision for our exhibit might be. And while we hadn't yet found Lillian to illustrate it for us, and we hadn't yet digitized that page yet, I knew I wanted to capture the energy of that both humble and historic moment. I wanted visitors to come in and stay a while with Montgomery and Anne. I imagined the site leading visitors to and from all the manuscript pages, letting them zoom and leaf through to study the ink, to watch videos and read articles about Montgomery, then move back into the manuscript to pour over the text on the back of the pages, or to simply sit, as Elizabeth Epperly once did, in awe of the story that Montgomery crafted. I sketched, in colored pencil no less, 
what I thought the site might look like. <laughs> I left room, I don't know if you can see that over on the left, for cool things, that's what I <laughs> put on the left there. Um, as you'll, this was my sketch in the beginning. But since then, I think we've d outdone my sketch. From your first moment entering the site, you'll be invited to explore every intriguing detail of the digitized manuscript. Every pen stroke and scribble, every edit and revision, and every intriguing mystery or lingering question. Our web developer, Graphcom, here in Charlottetown, built a site that will allow everyone to experience and to search the full exhibit and explore the full manuscript. A variety of experts and readers provided articles, context, media, and archival material that will deepen your reading of Anne. We sought out experts in social and environmental history, historical textiles, the island tourism industry, translation, and the history of Anne of Green Gables the musical here at the Confederation Center. Betsy and I spent hundreds of hours with Montgomery's pages, transcribing and annotating them in text, image, audio, and video with helpful context and commentary. I also spent many hundred hours loading each of those annotations onto the site, but that's a story for another time. So I'm gonna tease a little bit and give you some other sneak peeks of the surrounding exhibit before I show you more of the manuscript. There are four themed areas of the site in which there are 24 articles written by Betsy and me and by contributors from 15 countries. Each of these articles includes a variety of material, all complemented with sketches from Lillian G, which I've sprinkled throughout this preview, and full of links to and from the manuscript itself. The author section includes articles about Montgomery's history, her families, her reading impulses, including a list of all the literature referenced in Anne of Green Gables. There are 55 different references, and I think 26 of those are to poems, which seems fitting. There are articles, articles about the many sites in PEI and Ontario that honor her today, as well as a fully illustrated timeline of her life and work. The timeline includes a few new and rare tidbits, like the original publishing contract that Montgomery signed with L.C. Page in 1907, which has never before been digitized. And you probably can't read that, but Montgomery only made 10% on the wholesale price of Anna Green Gables. The writing process section explores the origins of the manuscript, including that moment Montgomery began the novel and how she planned, mapped, drafted, and revised. Everly's articles explain the alphanumeric revision system that Montgomery had developed as a prolific short story writer, and she answers that question, what's on the backs of the pages, exploring the scratch paper that makes up the first third of the manuscript. Montgomery's Island includes articles on the social and natural history of PEI that influenced Montgomery in her writing, histories of the McNeil home where she grew up, and the Green Gables house she visited, and on the past and present of Cavendish, including a newly digitized page of the minutes of the Cavendish Literary Society, taken down by Montgomery herself in 1906. On the agenda that day, a talk by her future husband, Ewan MacDonald. And finally, the articles in Anne's Legacies explore the translations and adaptations of Anne on stage, page, and screens large and small across time and across the globe. There is Anne TV and Anne Ballet and Anne Anime and even Anne Topiary. Covering the World, one of the articles in that section, features responses and book covers from readers and scholars around the world. Iran, Ukraine, Sweden, Japan, who all told me what Anne meant to them and what Anne means to readers there. These four sections and the articles within them stand alone as rich new sources on Montgomery and Anne. But in the end, they are designed to lead you to and from the manuscript, which, finally, right, is a small yellowed stack of pages of irregular sizes housed here at the Confederation Center, and you saw it on the way in. It has been on display, as Kevin mentioned, off and on over the years, 
but one can generally only see one or two pages at a, at a time when the manuscript is on display under glass. Montgomery herself allowed just the first page to be displayed at a hotel in Toronto in 1935. The stack measures approximately six and a half centimeters high and is only a bit larger than a trade paperback. Its 571 sheets of paper are covered front and back in two sections, story, the body of the Anne novel, and notes, where Montgomery kept track of her editions. The notes pages begin with note A, her first addition to the running text, and continue all the way through the alphabet 18 times, a little more than 18 times, ending with note S19, the last addition to the text. However, as I mentioned, the first third of those story pages and the corresponding third of the notes are written on scratch paper, like the one you see crossed out here. In all, there are 289 pages of other material, including bits of 15 short stories and poems. On the poem pages, you can see where Montgomery tried out a couple of her early short-lived pen names, Maud Eglinton and Maud Cavendish. When you enter the manuscript site, you will find a myriad of media to experience and tools to try out. We committed to including something, annotation or note, on all 1,142 pages. You will find images to illustrate the scenes, audio clips and videos to go with the text, navigation tools to find your favorite chapters, a full search tool so you can get right to what you're looking for in French and English, you can also turn off these annotations and browse Montgomery's pages just as they are. And you can zoom and explore every page. There is so much to learn from Montgomery's handwriting or from watching how and where she dipped her pen, how she built a chapter, or how she chose a word. You can easily find moments in the manuscript and their corresponding notes pages, like that most famous line, I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers, which was an addition to chapter 16. It's also just plain fun to see those memorable scenes in their original form. Yes, Montgomery really did emphasize the green in Anne's hair when she dyed it, and the E in her name when she spelled it out loud. And you can find that kindred spirit Diana was nearly Laura, and then Gertrude, before she was Diana, but Anne seemed to like her name either way. Each page and pen stroke show the blend of thoughtful planning and creative spontaneity that brought Anne to life. There are pages without edits and lines fully scratched out that just beg for you to zoom in and look for the tails of letters or to see how she ran her pen through the line. There are strings of mysterious numbers on the scratch pages and if you can see that when you get close, it looks like the two and the 71 were added later. They mean something, I haven't yet figured it out, but they are indexed on the site and I hope someone else can manipulate them and figure out what they mean. There are renumbered pages and hundreds of small edits that show Montgomery at her craft. We had experts and designers build maps we asked scholars and Montgomery adjacent folks to record themselves reading all 38 chapter titles. And we resurrected material recorded for the CD-ROM, The Bend in the Road, from the year 2000 <laughs> that may have been forgotten since so few of us have CD-ROMs anymore. I also lost track of how many archives we contacted to borrow or use material. There is more than I could possibly cram into this short preview and I've listed so many of the things that you can learn on the site. The site is really meant to be a celebration of story that invites visitors to learn and read and immerse themselves. As I say in an article on the site, Montgomery was surrounded by stories. They were woven into the island's small communities and they opened new worlds for her too. She treasured books as gateways to daydreams and imagination, and she dove into her own writing where she could shape the imaginations of her readers. For Montgomery, stories were vital. She read and she journaled and she toiled over her craft, escaping into books and living on the page. It is truly a gift to get to spend time with those pages. I can't wait to read the papers that get written about the manuscript, 
or hear about the teachers who use the site in a class. I've joked on and off throughout this process that it has clearly taken a small army of us <laughs> to get one of Montgomery's projects on the internet. And I imagine she would have heartily enjoyed watching us zooming and studying to decide whether or not a stray pen mark was a comma or a semicolon. We spent hours on questions like that. I have loved Montgomery's words since I was a child, and since I figured out that I was named after one of her other heroines, Emily Bird Starr. I've also been lucky enough to be a part of the Montgomery world since high school, when my mother brought my 13-year-old sister Anne, yes, Anne, and I to the island for an academic conference, like you do in high school. As I'm sure you all did that. It was then I learned that the island is the perfect place for the humble and the historic. It has been the honor of a lifetime to work on this project and to welcome more of you into Montgomery's world. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions, if anyone has questions. We have microphones available here if anybody <laughs> has any questions. Do you have the differences between the published version, the first edition, and the manuscript? Do I know the differences? Do you have the differences on the site? We, ha we have the differences, but we show um, the significant ones. We expect those of you who want to dive in that deeply and compare this to the first edition to later editions, you'll have to bring your own published copy. But some of the significant ones we point out that are a little bit different, but it's a good question. Other Do we know how long it took Montgomery to complete this manuscript? Not entirely. We know she began writing it in this, when she signed that contract. There was clearly a draft, so somewhere in that period. You can find, though, in the manuscript places where she dips her pen and really is cruising. There's no changes. The ink is running together. She's writing quickly. And, then, and you can see that go on for many pages. She clearly had a lot of time that day. And then there's other times where it's, she's kind of dipping in and out. So it's, you can see a little bit of that progress, but we don't know exactly how long. Speaking of contract, you mentioned she yes. got 10% on the wholesale price. On the wholesale. So do you have an approximate dollar figure of that? From um, I'd have to look. She kept track in her ledgers. I'd have to look exactly how much she made on the first, like the first three editions of the novel. It wasn't as much as she should have. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, what's your next project? Would it be another digitization project? Or, yeah, what's next? I have lots of projects. Um, I'm at work on the Ella Montgomery Bookshelf Project for the, with the Robertson Library and the um, Ella Montgomery Institute. And we're working on a physical and digital kind of bookshelf of some of Montgomery's favorite reads. Books that she actually owned and read, or books we know she read and loved. Um, so that's one project. I know there's more manuscripts maybe to come someday as well. <laughs> What is your personal favorite part of the website? Ooh, that's a good question. I'd probably say I do love seeing the, the, her, the minutes of the Cavendish Literary Society when she took those minutes because she's writing in pencil and you can tell she has a public audience, so she's kind of keeping the minutes very clearly and professionally, but she had to have had a little moment when she wrote Ewan's name. Like, they, were, they knew each other by then. <laughs> I think that's probably one of my favorites. The other thing that I saw as I went through the manuscript, it is so funny. It is so much funnier on rereading. And a lot of the funniest parts were notes that she added later. She clearly, she had a really good sense of comedic timing. And at a lot of those pieces, the funniest bits are additions to the novel, which is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Between the digital domain mm -hmm. and how, after a number of years passed, keeping up with technology and mm -hmm. sites, are there ways to prepare for even the manuscript as a long line that keeps going? As mm -hmm. 
So the question was about like digital preservation, not just preserving the physical copy, but keeping this digital version alive. This, the site as it is will run for at least five years, possibly with renewal. I know we've talked about other ways of storing the files or transforming the files so that they can last, you know, as different technologies change, we can read different kinds of images and all those things. We've talked about that, how to keep these wonderful high-res images stored and safe going forward, even beyond the life of this exhibit. That's definitely something we've talked about. I don't know, I mean, who knows what's to come in terms of which types, but it's definitely a consideration. As a Montgomery scholar, mm -hmm. What was the most surprising thing you learned about LM Montgomery in your research for this particular project? Sure. The thing that has struck me over and over is that this was her first novel. That should be the one that you're like practicing on, right? That should be the messiest. That should be the, you know, you, could, you should be able to see all that in the, the manuscript and you don't. Her system of revisions, that alphanumeric system, she started it with Anne and she did it with every novel until she was done. They all, she maintained this system. So it's amazing to me that whatever drafting system she decided on when she sat down to write a novel stuck with her. And the manuscript is very clean. It's very, she knew exactly what she was doing. She had outlined it, she had planned it. Those additions are wonderful, but it's, been, it's really surprising to see someone's first novel be so clean and pristine and, and you can follow it. That, that was really surprising. You'd expect the first novel to be the one full of scribbles, right? But it's not, and that, it's kind of remarkable. Hi, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just going back to, you said there's a five year um, mm -hmm. limit on it. Is, is this um, online project, is this a living document or would you call this closed and then you would reevaluate in five years? Like sure. if you <clears throat> have things you would wanna add to it or if new scholarship becomes available that might affect sure. some of the notes you've made, is it, is it something that could be changed or adapted or added to over the next five years? Um, I imagine this version of the exhibit staying for five years, but that doesn't mean that when that five years is over that there's some, some other things we've learned or ways, what I, I, I would love to take some of the pages with scribbles and use some different imaging techniques to see if you can figure out what's under the scribbles. But, so things like that might come along, but I think this exhibit, this version is just getting the manuscript out into the world and then we'll see what exciting things are on the horizon after that. No, the, every manuscript, the question was about what's on the backs of the pages of the other manuscripts. Some manuscripts run front to back with just story. Some do not. Jane of Lantern Hill is written on the back of like letters and Ewan sermons and a whole variety of things. So I, I think she used, for the most part, whatever paper was around. And so it, it's not always clear whether she was planning, I bought new paper for this manuscript or she used whatever. There's a variety. There's, they don't all have this unique collection of previous material on them. Yeah. I will pass on, we have people in the chat online and oh. you have greetings from Japan. <laughs> Shout out to Japan. Also, Ann Wooster is on the chat. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's great. All right. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing what you find at Ann Manuscripts. Thank you.